I've been meditating now for 42 years. And uh, something happened to me when I was in my early 20s. Um, and it turned out to be more important than I knew at the time. And it had to do with a kind of, um, well, I'll just say it. It had to do with a dawning of, of a silence that became permanent behind all of my thoughts. And the way I experienced it was, imagine that um, you have a, you're thinking or you're listening to me, but behind what you're doing right now, behind you're listening to me, there's another thought. Don't forget to pick up the milk. And another thought. Don't forget to you know, change the oil. And why did she say that to me? And, you know, it's like, so imagine all of those background noise just kick out, just stop one day. And that's what it was like, what happened to me. And when that happened, the interesting thing was that what replaced all the chatter inside was silence. Just wonderfully big, as it were, vast, open, without limits. So that, it, that happened to me at 40, I mean, excuse me, at 24. And the thing was, um, here I'd had this fantasy of what the word enlightenment was going to be. And I thought, oh, it's going to be this amazing thing. And, this experience did not do what it was supposed to do. I didn't feel better. I was still anxious a lot. I still got depressed. Can you maybe and, speak up a little bit, just a tad? And, and, and trying to make sense of that conundrum has become the core of my life, and in fact, the core of the book. Because we have these fantasies about what enlightenment's going to be. We think it's going to be, life is going to be perfect. We think everything's going to be wonderful. And my experience was, it just wasn't quite what it was cracked up to be. Actually, it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. So the, the challenge of my life has been, for the last 30-some years, to try to make sense of what this stuff is. And to try to make sense of, if enlightenment isn't giving us the kind of really good life that we're after, well, what will? And that becomes the question of the book. I think that carrying silence is a good thing. I think it's a helpful thing. But I don't think it's the kind of personality transplant that we were told about when we were young. So then the question becomes, how do you find a good life? What is the key of creating a good life? And here, that's sort of the second question that the book swirls around. The first question is, well, what happens? And the second question is, is um, how do we get the good life? What is the good life? How do we get that? And the key for me is that silence itself carries a certain emotional tone. And the emotional tone of silence I would describe as a kind of open and effortless quality. It's, it's, it's almost as if the, the Taoist term Wu Wei characterizes it about as well as anything does for me. Wu Wei means creative non-resistance. That sense of non-resistance is the quality that silence has. So for me, the question is, how do I get to be non-resistant in all the pieces of my life? And one of the tricks that I've discovered in the course of the last 20, 30 years um, is that every time I tell something that is the real story, the real truth that I've been kind of keeping from myself, that I've been hiding from myself. Every time I do that, I become less constricted in that area. So much of my life over the years has been thoughts I didn't want to think or feelings I didn't want to share or things I didn't want to say to myself or say to somebody else. So the challenge for me has always been, how do I let the stuff that I'm holding back, how do I let the stuff that's keeping me kind of bound up, how do I let that out? And for me, and what I say in the book is, that the key, I think, is can I tell the real truth to myself? Can I let out what is really so for me? Can I let it out to myself primarily? Can I let it out to somebody else? It doesn't mean, by the way, that I have to say to the people around me, you're a problem and I'm really frustrated with you. That doesn't actually help much. Think about the difference between saying to my saying to my wife, you've been mean to me, and my saying to my wife, I've been mean to you. It's a whole different matter. And the key act, I think, is can we tell what's really true for us? Can we reveal to ourselves, can we reveal to others what's really been going on? 
So the book is an exploration of both what's the experience of enlightenment and it's also an exploration of how do we get to that more open, free way to be. And for me, um, m much of my first discovery of this becoming more open happened in psychotherapy, which I think is a very good tool. Because every time I let go or I said to myself what was really bugging me, that is to say, every time I told the real truth about something, I became freer. And there was just, and, and that sense of freedom is the same sense that the silence carried. That is, silence has the quality of, ah. And when you tell the truth, when you tell what's really been bugging you, it has the same quality of, ah. It's almost as if you take a rock off your chest and you just kind of, then you can breathe easier. You've been sort of holding something in, and now you can kind of let it go. So that for me, telling the real story, telling the real truth in psychotherapy has been a huge gift, and it's the same kind of thing that happens from silence. Well, what I've also discovered over the past 10, 20 years is that um, I can do this not only with somebody that's a professional, but I can do it with people that I like, I can do it with friends. And there's something about sharing with peers that is so freeing and so such a gift. And it always, I used to think that the only way to be spiritual in life was to be, to talk very quietly, to have that deep voice. Uh, in the TM world, the Transcendental Meditation world, it also involved moving your fingers like this. So I used to think that there was a particular way to be spiritual. And it also meant that some things were spiritual and some things weren't. But over the years, part of my discovery has been that if I can be free in all the domains of my life, for example, if I can dance with abandon, if I can, if I can be talking with somebody in an emotional way, if I can do my spreadsheet work and do my work as a businessman, uh, can I do all of these things and can I do them all with the same kind of freedom? that I want to bring to the rest of my life. That, I think, is what it is to be spiritual. I used to think it was something that was much more about that deep voice and calmness. But I think, rather, being able to dance to rock and roll is also a spiritual act. So, what I think we should be after, and what I'm after, is true freedom, deep and wide. It includes the tears that well up with unabashed love, the easy smile that comes from a fully resolved issue with another, the silence that can only be known by being it, and laughter, real belly laughter at the rabbi, the priest, and the minister that walks into the bar. Such freedom deep and wide flows into love when the lights go dim, into mourning when we face death, and gets down, really down, when the rock and roll band cranks up. And in the midst of it all, it is as subtle and as non-resistant as the wind. The goal I am envisioning, then, is to be effortlessly open to live with jazz in the soul under any circumstance on the settled ground of spiritual spaciousness. Now that's a goal I'm after. Okay, so you got any thoughts or questions? Is there any, is there any specific path to enlightenment? You know, I used to think so. When I was a TM, uh, he asked, is there any path to enlightenment? Um, and, and when I was a, a TM, I am a TM teacher, a Transcendental Meditation teacher, and I used to say, yes, this is the fastest way. But you know, I, I'm, I'm a little more mature than I was then. And what I think now is that there are many, many different ways. There are many paths, and different paths work for different folks. And I'm not in a position to say, you've got to do this. That's your home. However, I can say, and the book says, that the one thing that helps is a steady commitment. In other words, to sort of dibble and dabble over here, and then to try something over there, that tends to lead you into a into a what what um, what's been called spiritual materialism. In other words, I, I'm sort of fascinated by this, and I'm fascinated by that. But I think to be consistent about what you're doing, to be strong and steady, and I think is really the key. Anybody else? Um, any, any potential warnings from your experience? Any things to perhaps you know, watch out for on that journey looking for, for spiritual sort of growth? You know, uh, that, that's a good question. He said, are there, anything, are there any things to worry about? Or are there any particular warnings? 
Um, one thing about the spiritual path that I'm quite, quite a fan of is that the path of spirituality is a path of growth. And if it's a path of real growth, that means you grow in all the different domains of your life. It means in all the different areas of your life. And if spirituality is going to work, it means that you're constantly at it. That is to say, you're always growing. So if you run into a problem in the spiritual path, I think you and your spiritual path, as it were, your commitment to growing and discovering, will itself start to handle whatever the problem is. You'll recognize it. But I think that the challenge is, and, and we all know people on the spiritual path that start to lord their path or lord their experience over the next couple. And I think that's dangerous. It's dangerous for you and it's dangerous for the other people, the, the people that you're coming in contact with. Um, I don't think you ever get rid of the ego, but I think you do and can and should be working to bring the ego under a certain kind of control so that it's not running you, but rather you're recognizing it's here and it's just part of what you are. Yeah. Good, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, hiya. Yeah, one of your um, fellow <coughs> meditators, I think her name is Suzanne Segal, wrote a book called Collision with the Infinite. Yes. And she had an enlightenment experience getting off a bus in Paris, as I remember, after some years doing TM. Yeah. And <coughs> for her, it was a really terrifying experience yeah. that, you know, caused the years of psychotherapy and God yeah. knows what else. Yeah. I mean, you must be familiar with the book. Oh, for me with the book and for me with the problem. Oh yeah, exactly. So what I'm asking is, when you had your enlightenment experience, it was obviously a positive thing, but for Suzanne it was obviously a terrifying thing. So how can, how can people be prepared for, you know, what's going to hit them? Um, first of all, different people's experiences are different. Some people have a sort of quieter thing, quieter time of it, some people have a more pleasant time. Mine was not pleasant. The, the, the hard part for me was trying to make sense of it. It just didn't make sense. That here I was carrying the silence on a permanent basis, and I was struggling a lot. But it wasn't that the thing hit me, and it, it, it in itself was that painful. It was rather, it was pleasant enough, it was, it was comfortable enough, but just not understanding what was going on was really the problem for me. There are people that, that have such experiences. I actually uh, gave a talk last night, and there was a woman that came up to me afterwards, and she said, she had never heard of the word enlightenment when this permanent silence descended on her. And she really didn't know what to make of this, didn't know the word for it. And she was a little freaked out by it, she was scared by it. And I think that, that um, um, there's another book that I, I personally found more useful than the Suzanne, what's her last name? Seagal. Seagal. Yeah, Seagal. Yeah. Um, and that is a book by a woman named Bernadette Roberts that I'm sure you carry, called The Experience of No Self. Um, and in that book, she also had a really rugged go of it. She had a very difficult time. And she and me, I mean, we both did this, started to read and try to make sense of what this was. And I went to graduate school to try to figure it out. Um, and she read and read and read and finally, she read everything she could in the Christian tradition. She was a Christian. So I think this, these sorts of experiences do call for us to try to integrate with them, try to make sense of them. And I think that's the problem for all of us in the spiritual path. That is, we get these experiences, whether it's a permanent silence or just a sort of flash of it, you get the experience and, and you don't know what to make of it. You don't know how to integrate it into your life. So the challenge of bringing this to your everyday life is the challenge that I faced and is the challenge that the book is addressing. How do you bring this into everyday life is really the hard part. And uh, I think that t telling real truth is, is helpful for that, but there are lots of tools that we can, we can use and lots of techniques. But the book describes that, and, and um, yeah, that's a good question. And, and I think it, it is some people's experience. Yeah. What, what's, what's next? Is there another book you want to write? Uh, actually, this is the first of a trilogy. Um, my idea is to write a book about spirituality in the I, spirituality in the we, and spirituality in the world. The world piece I'm finding particularly interested, but I'm about halfway through the book on, on relationships and how to bring it into relationships. And then I, I think it centers on the whole notion of truth telling, but what it means to have, a, to have an actual, no kidding, spiritual relationship is the, the question. Yeah. Anything else? Are you meditating every day? Every day. I haven't missed a day in 47 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and how do you, I mean, is it a, a particular oh. time in the morning or is it? Um... I do transcendental meditation. It's always worked for me. It's very comfortable for me. 
Um, I do. I meditate when I sit, when I get up, and then in late in the afternoon I meditate. And for me, it's it's um, it's the cure for fatigue. When I meditate, I feel better afterwards. So it's, I really need to meditate in the afternoon. Um, and then I also go off on a, a ten day retreat every year, a solo retreat, meditation retreat, and I spend six to eight hours meditating there. But I've done this for a long time, so I kind of know what to expect. Sir, how long do you meditate for each session? I, I do a half an hour at a time. And then when I go off on retreat, I meditate for an hour. So I'm a bit of a meditation junkie. <laughs>